Uh, so I'm Eric Skablik, so welcome to Dallas Fire and EMS. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, as a cohort, so as a group going through the Recruit Academy, uh, so welcome. But what I think we'll do just for a few seconds uh, is tell us who you are, right, and tell us why you want to be a member of Dallas Fire. So Seth, let's start with you. Um, I'm Seth Waller. I want to be a part of this because I've been growing up watching my dad. I've been kind of jealous of what he does, so I want to try it out. Pretty straight up. Go ahead. Tristan, my dad is all Tristan? Yeah. Okay. Welcome. My dad works for Salem. Okay. Uh, I've always looked up to him. Good. Okay. My name is Chris Tate. Um, my grandparents were both volunteers in Colorado, and I wanted to be, wanted to do this since I was about 16, so finally, finally making it happen. Cool. Welcome. Uh, James Firestone, similar tradition here. Uh, my grandfather was fire captain for Sheridan as a volunteer for a bunch of years. So kind of do that as well as seeing some of the stuff that's happened recently with the, the wildland fires and stuff, being mm -hmm. able to be a part of that and help versus sitting on the sidelines. Okay. My name is Kaylee. Um, my dad was here for my whole childhood, so I just wanted to be Okay, cool. Last but not least. My name is Daniel, and similar to the reason about the buyers, is like, I've grown up in Dallas for a majority of my life, so I wouldn't want to see it burn down. Okay. So okay. We're going to actually talk about that, so yeah. Yeah. So, Good. That's, well, that's my reason. Cool. Well, welcome. And then there's one more person that's not here yet, so we'll get them caught up when they get here. So um, the reasons that you brought up are not uncommon to a lot of our members here and, and fire departments across the country, right? There's, there's some connection to why people join a volunteer fire department, right? So a lot of you are because somebody in your family uh, either has been or, or were or currently are. Uh, involved in the fire service or you've been affected by what you see on the news or what you've been through right so some people have been through a fire or a medical emergency and they go I want to be able to help my family in case something happens like this again so uh, and it doesn't always include firefighting right sometimes it could be just I want to take a first aid CPR class because I want to take care of my family in case something happens um, so welcome to Dallas Fire and EMS and, and similar to all of you um, my grandfather was a firefighter um, as a volunteer, but I grew up next to the county police and fire academy where I lived. Um, so I was in and out there all the time. Basically, that was my playground for my brother and sister and I. So um, eventually somebody said, well, why don't you just become a firefighter? So I signed up to be a volunteer firefighter back in 1980. Uh, and I've been in the fire service ever since. Um, so what I'm going to do this morning is kind of go through Dallas Fire and EMS and then the fire service as a whole. Because you're getting into something that we have a lot of jargon, right? We have a lot of terms that we use for things and it's important for you to understand what those are so that you can figure out how to kind of work through uh, our process. So think of it almost like a map, right? If you're going to go from here to let's say um, Stockton, California, you can go to MapQuest, right? Um, there is no map quest for Dallas Fire and EMS, right? It's not like, hey, tell me about Dallas Fire. So there's some stuff on the web page, uh, but what I'm going to do is talk to you kind of about the history of the organization uh, and then the fire service as a whole and, and how the organization kind of runs so that way you kind of figure out how you play a role because all of you now, since you've walked in here, are now members of Dallas Fire. Right, so you represent the organization. Um, so going back to the comment earlier, um, if you look at 1878, um, Dallas Fire was formed because Dallas burned down. Uh, if you've ever gone past Yugo's Pizza, right, have you seen a mural on the side? Okay, the downtown burned down here. Okay, and there were some other fires in the area, so the neighbors at that time felt that they should form a fire department. So at that time, Dallas wasn't even a city. So the fire department actually existed um, before Dallas was formed. Back then, there was something called Cynthian, which was this area, and then North Dallas. Eventually, those two communities merged to become the city of Dallas. But Dallas Fire was actually a fire department before the city was formed, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so today, um, we serve the entire city of Dallas, right? So um, we, let me bring this over closer so Nikki doesn't have to move around too much. So we are right here in Polk County, okay? So Dallas serves 14,000 plus 
residents. So any fire medical call in the city of Dallas is handled by this fire station. Okay, uh, and this fire station is kind of unique because we have both career people that work here and then volunteers. Okay, so I'm a volunteer, you're going to be volunteers. Uh, but for example, Chief Petner, uh, Nikki, Frank, the medics, they work here. This is their career, right? So that's what they do. Uh, and then our ambulance service covers roughly 125 square miles around Dallas. So the medics go all the way up to Butler Hill, if you know on Highway 22, all the way to the Chevron station going the other way, uh, right up to the railroad tracks there on Highway 99, down to Cloud Corner. Uh, and then we also go all the way out to Bridgeport for the ambulance area. So that's a pretty big area that the medics put on, uh, and that's the area that we protect um, for EMS calls. So if somebody gets sick in those areas, we're the ambulance responder, right? Uh, we also respond to fires outside the city, but that's not our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to protect this community. Make sense? Okay. Um, so about uh, 600 calls a year, the fire department runs on, okay? So if you're a member of the fire department, your pager will go off or your iPhone will go off about 600 times. Okay, that doesn't mean you have to come to every call. Okay, that's not realistic for you to come every call because you have a life outside of Dallas Fire. Okay, your number one priority should always be your family. Your number two priority should be your job. Your number three priority should be Dallas Fire and EMS. We should never take the place of number one or number two. Okay, we don't want you to leave your kid's birthday party. Okay, um, we don't want you to lose your job because you're coming to a fire. Okay, family is always first, your job is second, we're number three. Okay, you have to have balance, okay? Uh, and with 600 calls a year, that's why we've kind of migrated over to having Nikki and Frank and the day crew as firefighters respond on calls because it just wasn't sustainable anymore for the volunteers to run that many calls. And out of those 600, probably 75% of those are medical related, right? Either helping the medics or taking the place of the medics because they're tied up. So we had to do something different here because it just wasn't sustainable. So we've got a pretty good system going. Uh, in the fire service, as far as jargon, there's three kinds of fire departments, okay? There's a career fire department. So your dad, right, works at Salem. That's a career fire department. Everybody that works at Salem Fire is an employee, okay? We're a combination department. And what a combination department means is that you have paid staff, career staff, that are augmented and, and supported by volunteers. Right, so at 6 p.m. at night, or I'm sorry, 7, right? At 7 p.m. when the day crew goes off duty, the engine leaves this building as a volunteer engine, right? So there's no career staff here. They go home at, at 7 p.m. when they're off shift, and then the volunteers would respond out. Also in the daytime, let's say that we have a larger fire that requires more than one engine response. So let's say there is a, a commercial fire, let's say um, Safeway caught on fire. I mean, I hope that doesn't happen, but let's say it does. Um, the day crew would get the first engine out, perhaps a second one, depending on what other staff are here, and we'll talk about that. And then the ladder and everything else is staffed by volunteers, right? So we have to be available to respond to those calls here. Uh, and then the third type of fire department is what's truly a volunteer department which is there are no paid people at all. Um, so a good example of that would be Fall City up to Canyon here. So Fall City is truly a 100% volunteer fire department. Um, they have nobody that lives in the building, nobody that works at the station. Um, they respond when there's a call in as a volunteer fire station. So we've got all three of those uh, around this area. So making sense? Okay. All right. So uh, for the medics, the medics, uh, so I mentioned fires responding on about 600 plus calls a year. The medics, the EMS are responding to more than 2,500 calls a year. So they're super busy, okay? And you'll get a chance if you're interested in EMS stuff um, to go out and ride along with them uh, and to be uh, engaged in them. And, and you'll also be able to even get your EMT certification if you want to be uh, involved in more doing EMS stuff. But that's entirely up to you. Okay, um, so one of the things I want to hand out to you uh, is something that's really important to us, but these are the core, core values and our mission and our vision. So, so if you want to take it, pass it around. Oops, same for you. Thank you. So what you wonder is what what does this organization do, right? So so if you think about what we do here. And, and who funds us, our funding comes from taxes, okay? 
So, so the fire trucks we drive, the fuel that we use, the employees that work here, the benefits that we get as volunteers are paid for by the people that live in this community, right? Either businesses or homeowners, okay? Um, and also people that have water meters in town, okay? Um, so we have what we call the utility fee that pays for some of the firefighters and medics that are here um, so that that way the tax base was offset. So they charge a, a fee on a water meter. Uh, as a public safety fee that helps pay for fire EMS and police officers uh, here in town and that's been really well supported okay but let's go through the mission vision values that you have in front of you uh, and hate to read to you but I, I think it's important that we kind of go through this so our mission is pretty straightforward we protect our communities from the adverse effects of fire and medical emergencies and other hazardous situations make sense Okay, so fire you get, medical emergencies you get, but what are other hazardous situations? What do you think about when you see that? Gas leaks, oil. Gas leaks, oil, oil leak. Okay, what else? Motor vehicle accidents. Motor vehicle accident, yep. What else? Flood. A flood, yep. What else? Person trapped somewhere. Okay, so maybe a person trapped in a confined space or in a machine. Uh, I, I hate to be that graphic, but I mean, those things do happen here in town. Okay, what other things are hazardous situations? Car accident. Car accident, yep, wire down, right? We get to a lot of wires down during windstorms, right? Uh, you know, uh, a tree branch takes out a power line and it's arcing. Uh, we'll go out there and, and help keep that area secure until the power company can come here. Gas leak, we already mentioned, okay? So, so it's not just fire, it's not just medical, okay? The other thing is it's not just hazardous situations, okay? Uh, we are kind of the community's answer to their 911 problems, okay? So that includes cats and drains, okay? If somebody sees a cat in a drain, uh, we'll go out and help with that. Okay, uh, if a person falls down, uh, we'll go down and help them with that. Okay, usually the medics will go out just to make sure they're not injured, uh, but there are times that the fire crew has to go out and help people that have fallen down. Okay, uh, and I'm just, just, just saying somebody's walking down the street and falls down, right? Somebody's calling and says that somebody fell down and, and needs help. Okay, um, so you get involved in a lot of different kind of things here. All right, so the vision of the organization is, is pretty straightforward. In addition to understanding its, its per purpose and reason for uh, existence, which we just talked about, all successful organizations need to define where they expect to be in the future. After having established the organization's mission, the next logical step is to establish a vision of what Dallas Fire and EMS Department should be and achieve in the future. So vision statements provide targets of excellence that the organization will strive towards and provide a basis for their goals and objectives. The following vision statement was developed by the Dallas Fire and EMS Department. Okay, so these are things that we see as an organization on our vision. We will be respected and respectful in our community and our membership. Okay, so what does that mean when you hear that? Respect each other, respect the community, respect people in the community. Yeah, because that's what we're here for, right? It's, we're not here about us, right? This isn't about us, okay? If you're here because you think it's cool to be a firefighter, that's great, but that's not why you should be here, okay? You should be here because you want to help neighbors, you want to help others, okay? It's not about us. We don't go out and say, wow, this is great, we get to go on a call. Uh, we go out because somebody needs help, okay? Um, so we want to make sure we're respected, okay? So how we carry ourselves, how we behave um, is important. Okay, because guess what? Now that you're a member of Dallas Fire, um, your neighbors will probably know that, and they're gonna look at you to say, hey, thanks for being a firefighter in town, um, but also they're gonna look at you a little bit differently, right? They're gonna expect something uh, more than you, because they're thinking, hey, this guy or this girl are gonna come to my emergency in case I call 911 and help my family. Um, so how you carry yourself now is a little bit different, right? Um, so you don't wanna be the person that has the party till four o'clock in the morning, right? And there's cars all over your neighborhood and everybody's at your house because they're gonna say, geez, this person's in the fire department. Uh, you know, all they do is party all the time. Because guess what, that reflects on us, okay? That reflects on you. So I'm not saying you've gotta change your lifestyle. I'm just saying be respectful, okay? And, and people will respect you as well. Uh, the next area we have is engage in collaborative decision making. So what does that mean? Be involved. Be involved, be active, right? Don't just be here as a drone. And what I mean by that is don't just come to calls, uh, be involved in the organization, okay? You might do something in your uh, outside uh, employment 
that is something cool that maybe the fire department should look at that we've never thought about, right? So that's coming to Chief Dickerson or April Welsh or one of the staff and say, hey, I've got an idea. This is something our business is doing. Maybe we could do something like this here, right? Um, so, so be involved and be collaborative, right? So um, we make better decisions when more people are involved in it. Now there's a time and a place for that, right? So, so if we're talking about something that we do as an organization, that's a time to be collaborative, okay? But if you're going to a fire call and an officer says we need to do this, that's kind of the way it works, right? It's not like, hey, wait, can we meet about it, okay? But there are times, and I'll be honest, that we as fire officers will have a discussion amongst other people on the scene to say, what should we do safely now that we've got the fire knocked down, right? Do we do this? Do we do that? Um, so there are collaborative decisions also on fire scenes. So it's time and place specific, okay? Um, the next one is adopt techniques and technologies to be an industry leader. So what does that sound like? Keep adapting, keep changing your tactics. Yeah, we are not wed to the past. Okay, so, so a lot of times you hear the fire service and you watch these TV shows and they make these uh, amazing fires occur every day, uh, which are so far from being real, right? Um, the, the, it's, it's laughable, some of the TV shows, right? Um, but what we do know is that tradition is important, okay? So tradition in the fire service is amazing, right? We have a lot of pride, we've got a lot of history, but we're not wed to that, okay? Because if we were, we'd still be driving fire trucks in the 1950s, okay? Uh, we're driving fire trucks now that have computers in them. Uh, for example, the ladder truck uh, has a computer in it that helps make sure that it's down and how far it's going out and how much weight in it is inside the bucket. Um, if we were wed to the past, we would have never embraced that kind of technology, right? So, so we're constantly making our jobs better, uh, and you'll see the same thing as you go through training with turnout gear, right? The firefighting gear you wear, uh, the technology is constantly evolving there, right? Um, so way back when I started, people got rubber coats, okay? I don't know if you know this, but rubber and fire don't go really well together, okay? Um, so that was something they did then to keep you dry, um, but realistically, it didn't protect you as far as thermal issues, right? So now you have advanced firefighting gear um, that in fact sometimes lets you go into places that's hotter than you realize it is because the gear is so protective, okay? So we constantly evolve. Um, the other thing you'll see um, during your training uh, is the air packs too, the self-contained breathing apparatus that you wear when you go inside a, a smoke-filled environment or toxic environment. The technology changes there have been evolutionary. I mean, we just continue to make it better, 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 and you'll get to see that. Okay, uh, the next one is being a leading resource for community safety and education. And what you're probably looking at saying, hey, I'm a firefighter, why would I care about any of that? Okay, why do we care about that? Anyone? Community safety and education. Well, here's a secret. I'm okay for the fire I don't go to. Okay, if we can teach people how to use a fire extinguisher, if we can make sure people have smoke detectors that wake them up when there's a fire in their house or smoke, uh, if we could teach them how to safely um, have a, a, a barbecue, right? If we could teach them um, how, to, how to do CPR, that's a call that we don't have to go to, right? And that's really the goal. Uh, ultimately, we want to have community members that are safe and engaged and know what to do in case there's an emergency. Because if they're calling us, what does that mean? They need help, right? And, and we're here to help, but that means that they need our help and it's gonna take us a few minutes to get there, okay? So again, education safety is kind of what we do. Little things that people don't think about, but like checking car seats for, for uh, parents, right? When they, when they have their newborn and they have a car seat in a car, right? They wanna make sure it's installed correctly. So those are safety things that we could do to make sure that their family's doing okay. Uh, the next one is be financially stable and fiscally responsible. So you're probably thinking, why would we care about money? Do you care about money? Do any of you have more money than you know what to do with? Other than maybe Seth Waller. No, the answer is no. We all have a budget, right? So we wanna make sure we're using the taxpayer dollars wisely for the right things, but also that, that we're good financial stewards. So that's why that's in there. Uh, the next one is be con committed to professional development of our members. Is that really the organization's responsibility or is that your responsibility? What's professional development? Getting better, right? Learning more, being a lifelong learner, okay? Um, we wanna make sure that we're giving you opportunities. So 
This training that you're going through now for the academy, this is so that you understand how to safely be an entry level firefighter, okay? Is that an obligation that we have by law? Yes, okay? Do you think we are crazy enough to just bring you down here, give you fire gear and a pager and say have a good time? No, we're not that crazy, okay? Are there some places in the United States that still do that? Sadly, yes, okay? This is a dangerous profession, okay? Whether you do it as a career or as a volunteer, there is a risk involved in fighting fire, okay? We need to teach you how to manage that risk. We need to teach you how to be a firefighter. We need to teach you how to be a safe and smart firefighter, okay? So that's what the training is that you're gonna go through. But then when you're done with that, you're not done with training, right? We drill every week, okay? Um, so we can be proficient in our skills. We also wanna learn new skills, okay? Because there's always new things coming around. And then we'll also send you to other training programs around the country, or at least around the state, okay? So we have a vehicle extrication program that actually trains firefighters in other communities. Um, we'll send you over to the Public Safety Academy where they do firefighter uh, weekend classes. There's other classes hosted in the area. Um, so we'll send you to those, right? If you wanna go to more uh, training opportunities, as long as budget allows, um, this organization will support you. Uh, on a national level, uh, we have also sent people back to the National Fire Academy, right? So, so we do want to make sure that we're investing in you because the more you know, the more you can help us. And really, more important, the more you can help your neighbors, okay? So we're all about that. Uh, the next one is anticipate and provide the resources to reflect the diverse needs of the community. So what does that mean? Keep adapting to the community. Yeah, is Dallas the same as it was 10 years ago? No. What's different about Dallas today? Subdivisions. Subdivisions with what kind of housing in it? What are you seeing in the subdivisions now? More houses on smaller lots? Yeah. Closer, together. Closer together. What kind of construction? Stick. Wood, stick, stick built, right? We have some multifamily housing. Okay, so, so we are constantly changing, right? We have to change on our response techniques and firefighting techniques based on that. The other thing you probably notice is skinny streets, okay? The streets to get in and out of those subdivisions are a lot tighter, right? Where they used to be really wide and you can get through, uh, a lot of those now are, are different because they want to put more houses in there. And the way you do that is you restrict some of the access and things like that. So we work through that. Um, the other thing um, is when you think about the needs of our community, um, there's some other things that we weren't dealing with 10 years ago, okay? And some of these are not fire related, but more EMS and safety related, okay? Uh, we have seen an uptick in people that are homeless in our community, okay? And we've also seen an uptick in people that have mental illness in our community. Um, so of course, as the 911 response group, uh, we have to know how to help those people out, right? So homeless people, people with mental illness are residents just like anybody else and we need to know how to provide them with services. So the medics do a lot of that, um, but there's gonna be times that a fire response also go along, goes along with that. Uh, so again, those are our residents also. We can't just say, hey, you're homeless, uh, you have a mental health issue. That's not what we do as human beings. So we have training uh, and, and ways that we can provide assistance to those people and get them the help that they need. Uh, and the next one is have strong partnerships in the community and industry. So what does that mean, partnerships? So, um, having good relationships with the with yeah, with police, that's a great one. Police and the sheriff and even state police. Who else do we have partnerships with, do you think? Local businesses. Why local businesses? Yep, fire prevention, good one, okay. What other partnerships? How many of you went to Dallas High School? Okay, do we have a partnership with Dallas High School? Yeah, every football game we have people there, right? In case somebody gets hurt, all right? Uh, we also will send a fire truck over if necessary, but those are partnerships that we have. The other thing that a lot of people may not realize, and, and Captain Airman Trout did this, uh, I believe, last year, but our medics and fire staff will go over and provide training to the high school athletic staff about how do they remove a helmet and gear from a football player in case they get hurt, okay? Because we want to make sure that they're not making something worse. And when we interact with them, like hand and glove, we want to make sure when our medics and firefighters interact with them that, that we know what we're doing and we know what they've done, right? So we kind of have that partnership, all right? So a lot of different things there. The other partnership we have with the high school uh, is something called Harpy Bovard. So we do a scholarship each year uh, for a high school uh, senior going to school for $1,000, okay? So we have a committee that goes over and meets with them and has applications brought in, uh, and then they select a person each year to help 
basically uh, go to college for a thousand bucks. So uh, again, a lot of different partnerships that we have. Okay, so if you flip over your paper, uh, and this will be the end of the reading assignment for, for my part, um, but what are, are the values, okay? And what our values are is what do we hold ourselves accountable to and what do we hold the organization accountable to? So they're pretty straight up. One is sense of community, and we've talked about that. We believe we have a duty to enhance livability and be a positive presence in the community, okay? Um, I will tell you that when you go somewhere, let's say you're leaving drill and you're going to Safeway to pick up something and you're wearing Dallas Fire Nemo sweatshirt, um, people will recognize that but people also see that as a community caretaker, okay? So, so you know, you're recognized, but also you have to keep that trust uh, in a very positive way. The next one is professional excellence and behavior. We strive for constant improvement to better serve the community and each other. Will we be courteous, respectful, and caring? Pretty straight up, right? Uh, we're gonna take care of each other, we're gonna take care of our neighbors. Uh, integrity, we are committed to honest and ethical behavior. That's a key one, isn't it? Yeah, because nobody wants to work with somebody that's unethical, okay? Nobody wants to work with somebody that has risky behavior. Uh, why? Because they put the organization at risk, but risky behavior also puts you at risk, okay? So, so we want to make sure that we have integrity. The next one is teamwork. We believe positive teamwork and shared leadership are integral to our organization. We will seek out and value the opinions of our members. Okay, I think we've talked a lot about teamwork and you're part of our team now, okay? Everybody that is a member of Dallas Fire and EMS, whether it's career or volunteer, is a key to this organization's success. We need everyone, okay? Like I like to say there's a thousand jobs for a thousand people here, okay? Uh, and then the last one is selfless selflessness. We will put the needs of others above and before ourselves while delivering service without recklessness. We will not work for recognition, but rather will do the work worthy of recognition. Pretty straight up, right? It's not about us, it's about helping people. And if you do that and you do that well, the recognition comes along with it, okay? It's not like, hey, let's go out and do this because it'll look good. Let's go out and help somebody, okay? And that's what we're really here for, okay? So any questions on the mission, vision, values, okay? I would just keep that somewhere in your book, maybe in the front sleeve, and if you're ever wondering why you're here, that kind of reminder is there. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, we kind of self-check each other also. Okay, um, so we make sure that we're doing the right things. All right, so we talked about the city. We talked about the ambulance building. Uh, one of the things, or the medic service area, sorry. So we partner with a lot of people in our area, okay? So if we go over here to Rick Real, we have station 130. Out on the other end, we have station 120. We also have station 140. So what does that mean? So around us, okay, we have Southwest Polk Fire District, okay? They are a district on their own. So the voters of their area, uh, back I think in 1946, 47, um, those residents outside the city decided that they needed fire protection, okay? Before that, Dallas would respond to everything, okay? Dallas was their fire department. Uh, even though we're a city department, we protected them. Um, but the voters of that area decided that they needed to have something uh, of their own. So they took a vote and they created what's called a special district, okay? So they basically levy a tax against their property tax to pay for a fire department, okay? So what they have is they have a station in Rickreal, they have uh, one in Fall City, but it's not really theirs, right? So Fall City is actually Fall City Fire Department, so they're much like Dallas, okay? They're a city department, but they're all volunteer, but they also provide a service area to that corner of the Southwest District, if that makes sense, out around Fall City. So they're gonna say we're gonna be the first ones there. Uh, and then the Southwest Polk is putting a new fire station out in Salt Creek, okay? Um, so they'll have a combination of some paid people there and some volunteers, but that was a corner um, that they didn't have. And then we have our other neighbor, which is Polk One. Okay, so when we go out that area, um, we have Polk Fire District number one out there. And they are primarily, um, when you listen on the radio, they're Station 90, okay? And Dallas, if you're wondering, starts with 100s. So everything out of Dallas, either Fire EMS is a 100. So Engine 100, uh, I'm sorry, Engine 101, Engine 102, Ladder 101, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's how we know who each other are, okay? Um, so those are the partners that we work with in Fire. Um, one of the things that, that happens is, uh, so let's say there's a house fire in Liberty Road. Okay, everybody knows where that is? 
Okay, Liberty Road is outside the city, okay? But if there's a house fire there, um, that we will respond to the house fire in Southwest Polk under our mutual aid agreement, right? So we're not gonna say, we're gonna let a house burn down. Uh, if it's something where we need to respond and they want us to respond, we'll go to that, okay? Um, but if there's somebody who has a car fire outside Liberty Road that's on fire, that would be covered by Southwest, right? So we respond based on the need. Making sense? And you'll get a lot more about that, so don't, don't I'm not gonna get too technical with you guys today. Okay, so, um, Let's talk about how we are structured, okay? So we've got here at Dallas Fire, who's in charge of Dallas Fire? Chief. The chief, okay? What does the chief do? Give me an idea, what's the, what's the life of the chief's, what's the day of a chief, the fire chief? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a manager, okay? It's, it's, if you want to look at it as a business model, it's like the CEO, right? It's the chief executive officer of the fire department. So if you think about that, what does a manager or a business owner do every day? Budget, personnel, managing relationships, politics, okay? Giving guidance and getting out of the way of other people that are, you know, doing their jobs, right? Getting them what they need so they can do their work. Fair? Okay, busy job? Yeah, we're at a lot of stuff going on here. So the chief has a deputy chief, okay? And that's Chief Dickerson. What does Chief Dickerson do? Training. Training, he's in charge of training. What else does he do? How about operations? What's operations mean? Are we a reactive organization or a proactive organization? Or both? Both, okay. So do you think it's important for Dallas Fire, so does Chief Brumfield wanna make sure that Chief Dickerson has people that are trained for the emergencies that we might have? Yeah, does he wanna make sure that we have policies and procedures for those incidents when they come up? Yeah, does he wanna make sure that the fire trucks are ready to go if there's a call? Yeah, does he want to make sure that we're maintaining all the equipment we have and we document it? Yeah, okay. So does Chief Dickerson do all of those things on his own? No, what does he do? Delegates. Delegates to who? Others, right? Other chiefs. Yeah, okay. So we have uh, EMS division, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we have community services, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then we have our suppression, group okay uh, and we have two captains we have a a captain and then we have a b captain and what that means is just your shift okay so captain airman trout is one of those and captain petner is the other one okay so let's talk about like equipment maintenance this is probably a discussion the deputy chief has with the captains to say we just want to make sure each day that the trucks are ready to go that the air packs have been checked and we have inventory ready and, and we're good to go fair okay so this happens every day Okay, or it might be, hey, we got a request to go over to Oakdale Elementary School at lunch today and, and have lunch with the kids. Uh, can you folks do that uh, on duty while you're there and go over and have lunch with the kids? Make sense? Yeah, so that's just operational stuff, okay? There's a lot more that they do, but that's the organizational part. Then we have EMS. Kim Storms is the EMS Division Chief. What does Kim take care of? Just think of the title, EMS Division Chief. What is she in charge of? EMTs and paramedics, right? Okay, so we have here at Dallas Fire four ambulances or medic units, right? We staff two of those. And what I mean by staff is 24 hours a day, we have four people that are paid to be on those ambulances to respond on those calls, okay? Each ambulance at a minimum or medic has to have a paramedic on it, okay? From our staffing plan. Now we have more than that, okay? I think we do three and one EMT on each shift, is that? Yeah, so we have three career people that are EM paramedics that work on our shifts here, and they actually work a 48 on, 96 off. So they're on duty for 48 hours, then they're off for 96 hours. So two days on, four days off, okay? So the medics that you see in the back, they're gonna work a 48 hour shift, then they're gonna go home for four days, and then we're gonna have two other groups of medics come in and basically do another 48, okay? So on each one of those shifts of career people, we'll have three paramedics uh, and one EMT. 
uh, and that's how we get the ambulances out. Anything after those two, so that would be Medic 101 and Medic 102, then that triggers Medic 103, okay, which is here in this building, okay? Medic 103 between 7P, 7A and 7A, guess who takes that out? The career people here, right? So that would be Nikki and Frank. They would take out that rig uh, if there was a Medic 103 call. And then Medic 104 is a spare that could be staffed either by, you know, the staff here, so April, uh, Chief Dickerson, or volunteers coming in if needed, but 104 is kind of a spare rig, uh, and very rarely has that ever been used. So I think maybe one or two calls, um, but it's here in case we need it. And the, since the medics work more than 2,500 calls a year, those rigs break down, right? So there's times they go out for maintenance, so we've got some spares here. But Kim Storms takes care of the day-to-day -day EMS operations, so not only staffing, uh, but also policies and procedures, um, but also some other things that most people may not think of for EMS, right? So we do case reviews, okay? So we have a physician advisor that we have here, not full-time, but part-time, uh, and what the physician advisor does is look at the care that we're providing to, to people that need medical assistance, right? So we'll pull certain cases and look at certain charts, like what they fill out, and, and talk about those kind of like a after action review, right? How do we do? What can we do different? Did we do the right drugs? Do we have the right tools, right? So we have those constant discussions there. Uh, and then the other thing that Kim wants to make sure that we do uh, is think about it from a medicine standpoint uh, is that we're managing a drug inventory, right? So we want to make sure that those drugs are managed properly so we know where they are. We want to make sure they're not expired, okay? Because some of the drugs that we have we may not use all the time. Okay, um, but we want to make sure that we have an inventory and that they're current. So the medics take care of that working with Kim. All right, so that's the EMS division. And you'll get more about that as, as you get into the organization. Uh, and then we have our community service officer. And all of you met her, right? April. What does April do? Community service things. Community service things. Okay, so what does that mean? Interacting with community. Yeah, so give me some examples, Seth. And you've been here long, so you know what they are. Um, recruitment. Yeah, is recruitment important for us? Yes. Why? That's how we gain our volunteers. That's how you guys got here, right? That's how I got here. Okay. Yep. Very important. Uh, interacting with community. Yeah. And such as keeping bonds with uh, business owners and somewhat of politics. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good example. So, so what April does is she recruits people, talented people just like you, um, because let's face it, people move on, right? I'm moving, right? I'm moving at the end of the month, um, so that means that there's going to be a vacancy here for a volunteer firefighter. Other people move, they get married, their jobs change, they decide to do something else, so we're constantly recruiting new members, okay? The other thing that we're doing is how do we retain our members, right? So what can we do as an organization? So uh, one of the things that you'll find that we do at the first of every month, so the first Wednesday of every month we don't have drill, we have a business meeting. But we have food ahead of that, and it's usually a really good meal, right, that is made by our members. And we do that so that you and your family members can come and have a meal together and meet other people. Okay, um, because that way they'll kind of get a connection about, oh, that's the person you talked about from recruit school, right? It's getting to meet your family members, okay? Um, so it doesn't mean bring all your family, right? So if you have friends from North Dakota, family in for like visiting, it doesn't mean you bring the 12 of them, okay? Uh, it means bring people from under your roof that are in your house, right? So that's how we kind of break bread together uh, and it works out really cool. Um, the other thing that April will do is it's these community events that we get involved in. So uh, the Chamber of Commerce will ask us to deliver Santa Claus uh, to, to light the Christmas tree downtown here, right? So we'll do that with the fire truck. So Wally uh, last time drove him out in the Mack truck, the antique. Um, we'll also put the Christmas lights on uh, a lot of parts of town. will ask us to help put up banners and, and snowflakes and all that kind of stuff, so we do that. Um, we have uh, escorted the high school uh, teams when they've gone to state playoffs, right? So just little community events that we do to kind of say, hey, we're proud of you and, and uh, we're out there and uh, we want to make sure we're involved in a lot of those different things. So April manages that, okay? And then who does the chief report to? Who's the chief's boss? City. The city, but who specifically in the city? Mayor. Ah, no, the city manager, okay? So the city manager uh, is hired 
to basically run the city. So um, if you think of what Todd deals with, right? So budget, personnel, uh, purchasing, equipment policies, procedures, the city manager makes sure that the same is happening with the other city departments. So, because we're not the only thing in town, right? Even though we think we are, right? We've got the coolest equipment. Uh, there's also some people next door that have guns, right? That are called police officers. So the police department also has the same things that we need, right? Policies, procedures, equipment, training, personnel. Um, there's a police chief, right? We also have public works. So public works has the same thing. Equipment, services, policies, procedures, personnel, um, public works director of the library. So the city manager balances all those different departments to make sure that those department heads or chiefs have what they need to do their job. Right. And how the city manager does that is he works with the city council to basically say, you know, here's what they're working on. Um, here's their needs. So so we're looking at, you know, 10 years into the future. So what we're looking at 10 years into the future between the fire chief working with the city manager and the city council uh, is the need for a training facility for Dallas Fire and EMS. Right. We don't have a place that we can light on fire or burn. Um, things, right? We're looking at a training facility so we can keep our skills current. Police are looking at the same thing, okay? The other thing that the police, for example, are looking at uh, is a new police station because they're really out of room and a discussion currently at the city council level is to combine police and fire into a public safety building because there's some things that we could share, right? Like a room like this for training, we don't need one and police don't need one, we could share that. But that's a long-term vision that the chief and the city manager and city council have, which is, you know, we need a training facility facility, joint public safety facility, uh, and then down the road, when you look five, x ten years out, we're going to have to replace some of the equipment down there, right? Because fire trucks, you know, wear out, just like other things. Ambulances wear out more than fire trucks do. So we have to constantly be working on, you know, getting funds for that next replacement. So that's what happens here, okay? So then on a more basic level, so this is kind of the, the overhead structure. Um, what we have is we have firefighters, okay? and that will be you folks and we have a bunch of firefighters and then we have apparatus operators and then we have captains okay and then we have either battalion chief or deputy chief that are also volunteers so what is the job of firefighters it's, it's not a trick question what are you signing up to do to respond to emergencies, put out fires, right? You could say, you know, put the wet stuff on the red stuff, right? It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you think you're gonna do that every day here, you'll be very disappointed, okay? Um, but you're here to respond to emergencies, fire, EMS, car accidents, public uh, emergencies, like we said, car, car wrecks, gas leaks, wires, okay? It's the day-to-day -day stuff. And then apparatus operators are just that. Okay, they are firefighters that have promoted and been trained to drive the trucks, right? To operate the ladder truck, to operate the pump. Uh, that's what their qualification is. And then we have captains. Okay, so captains are like that first level supervisor. Make sense? So usually on a call, you'll have a firefighter, an apparatus operator, and a captain. Okay, you'll hopefully have maybe more than one firefighter. Sometimes we have, you know, four firefighters, depending on what the call is. The apparatus operator, and then a captain. Okay, the captain is the officer, but if there's no captain, which does happen, the AO becomes the officer, right? So they're the senior firefighter, if you will. So they are responsible for the crew. And then the battalion chief or deputy chief, so Wally's the battalion chief, I'm a deputy chief. Um, we would respond as an officer as well, if needed, okay? So, so we're more in the leadership role, but we'll do any job necessary, okay? Making sense? Okay, and then to kind of augment, so this is the suppression family. We also have something we call support services. And as you become uh, more active here, and you'll see these folks on drill night, but what support services does is simply that. These are men and women that are not interested in fighting fire, okay? But what they wanna do is they wanna help the organization support the fire and EMS effort, but also help the community. So what they will do, for example, at a fire scene is they'll 
change out air packs. If you're wearing your air pack, they'll change out your bottles and get you a fresh one. They'll run those bottles down to the fire station, refill them with the compressor, and then go back, okay? Um, they may, if it's a structure fire and, and people are engaged in fighting fire, they may set up a rehab area, basically to take everybody's blood pressure, make sure they're staying hydrated, make sure nobody's getting ill, okay? Uh, might give you snacks, those kind of things. On a longer uh, incident, they might bring out food, depending on what we need. Um, but support is basically to support the operations of the fire department, right? They're not going to go in and fight fire, but they play an essential role on the scene, okay? The other thing in the support family is our chaplain group, okay? We have a number of chaplains, and if you look out behind the fire station, you'll see they have their own car, okay? So chaplains, if you think about what they could do, okay, they're not really here to be a religious group if that makes sense okay they're not here to proselytize or say you know are you a lutheran or a catholic or are you jewish right they're not saying do you want to join our church okay what they're here for is really self-care and community care because let's face it we are going to see some of our family members and our residents uh, our community members not on their best day okay so if somebody's apartment just burned down what's happened to them they've had a bad day right what have they lost a lot, right? If, if not everything, okay? So what do we do to help that family now? What can we do for them? Emotional support, okay? And also, let's not have you worry about where you're going to stay tonight. The chaplains will get you a hotel, okay? They'll work with the Red Cross and they'll say, look, let's get you some help, okay? Do you need a place to stay? Do you have family members? Yes or no? Let's make those calls for you, okay? Because they've had their bad day. So it's emotional support, right? Um, the same is true uh, car accidents, okay? We have run some pretty serious car accidents in our service area. Sometimes they're fatal, okay? Um, so the chaplains will come out and provide emotional support for the families involved, but also for us, right? Because some of you have maybe never seen a person that's deceased. Okay, um, we want to make sure that you are okay as you help people, right? We're, we're going to make sure that, that you're okay at the end of the call. So the chaplains will come out and provide support. They'll also stay with that deceased person uh, until they can be transported to a funeral home, right? So the chaplains play an important role. Uh, and the same is true if you think of really the more day-to-day -day thing that we see our chaplains is um, we have an older community in Dallas, right? Not everybody, but we have a pretty good percentage of people that are, that are elderly. Uh, and we do run quite a few CPR calls in town. Okay, we'll have a chaplain respond along with the fire and medic response on a CPR call for emotional support, right? Because here's your family member now, your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, that have just had a heart attack. Um, that chaplain can kind of work with the family while we're helping that patient. So, so the chaplains are an inter inter integral part of the organization uh, and they come up on the radio and they're chaplain 113, right? So again, remember everything in Dallas is a 100. Okay, so the fire chief is C100, okay, C101 is the deputy, um, the chaplains are chaplain 113, uh, and then all the fire response rigs are like engine 101, engine 102, the medics are medic 101, 102, 103, 104, okay, so just think 100, okay, 90 is Polk 1, 130 is Rickerill, 140 is Salt Creek, and 120 is Fall City. So those are all the people that we have in our family here in Polk County, okay, and then Salem, comes into West Salem because they're there, right? And they have a fire station there, but they're not on our radio system. They stay with the city of Salem radio system. They switch over if we're going to help them or they're helping us, um, but they won't, you won't hear West Salem fire trucks on our radio channel, if that makes sense. Got it? Okay. All right, any questions so far? Okay. So Chief, did you want me to take a break or did you want me to keep going? Okay. All right, so a couple of other things. So we covered the chain of command. You guys got that? Pretty simple, okay? Oh, and we made it really easy for you. It's all color-coded, okay? So, uh, firefighter helmets are what color, Nikki? Black. Black, okay? So you'll be getting a black helmet at some point, okay? You will probably have an orange shield on it that says probationary member, okay? Why would we do something so crazy to give you a different color shield? Exactly. Yeah, we don't want to send you into the wrong call by mistake, right? And, and here's the rule that we have while you're probationary members and, and before you get state certification, you have to be buddied up with somebody, okay? So there is no way ever that we would take three of you and just say, okay, take the hose and go into the fire, okay? 
Now that happens in some places of America. That does not help happen at Dallas Fire, okay? So you'll always be assigned to a firefighter or to an officer, right? So we wanna make sure that we have somebody next to you that can teach you how to do the tasks, um, but in a safe manner, okay? Um, so we kinda color code you differently so we know, oh, that's a probationary member. We can't let them do that, right? We, we have to put in safeguards in place. Um, so our captains are red, so their helmets are red. And then our chief officer's helmets are white, okay? So, so if you think about like pecking order, black, red, white, okay? That's the way our system works, okay? And, and it's pretty simple. And, and honestly, regardless of what color you have or what rank you have, uh, it doesn't matter. We're all here to basically work with each other, right? That's the command structure. Now, one of the things that I have to share with you um, is that, and this will drive the chief crazy, okay? Um, but these are not trumpets on the collar, okay? Um, so, so if you think about like what is the collar brass, and if you look at like military police, there's different ways you distinguish who's what rank they are okay so in the fire service we use speaking trumpets okay and we've got one in the center here um, and I'll just do you see it there in the center of the display case there's a, a silver trumpet or like speaking trumpet right so way back if you go into time okay uh, think about the early fire service okay there were no radios right we didn't have portable radios to talk on okay so way back um, the officers had a speaking trumpet, almost like a megaphone, like a cheerleader would have. So they would speak into that trumpet and give orders to the firefighters, right? So put fire here, do whatever, okay? So as a result, the fire service adopted the speaking trumpet for its rank structure, okay? So like a fire lieutenant, which we have, do we have any left here? We don't have any lieutenants at Dallas anymore. But a, a lieutenant would have one trumpet on their collar, right? So if you look at the military side, that would be a lieutenant, one bar, right? So fire service has one speaking trumpet. Uh, a captain has two straight up, okay, speaking trumpets. Uh, a battalion chief has two that are crossed. And then division chiefs have three, the deputy has four, and then the chief has five speaking trumpets, okay? Um, so don't ever say, you know, hey, I like your bugles. Um, those are just things that make them really awkward, but it's a speaking trumpet. So in case anybody ever asks, you now know the secret of that, okay? Making sense? And there's one up there if you ever have a question about it. Okay, so let's cover a few things. You guys doing okay on time? You need a break? So let's keep going then. So what is your role as a new member of Dallas Fire and EMS? Come to training, okay? That's super important. Come to calls when you're able to, okay? So you're not gonna come to calls until you're trained. I'll just tell you that right now. But when you're given a pager, we'd like you to come to calls when you're available. Remember, family first, job second, we're three, okay? Uh, attend events, so you know whether it's taking Santa around the block, we have Father's Day breakfast. Uh, if you could be here for those events, we would love your assistance. Uh, be active in the association, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, and then to be a community role model, okay? Because people are gonna watch who you are and what you do. All right, so let's cover some other things that you should know. So the Volunteer Association uh, is a group that we have here which meets on the first of every month. Okay, the first Wednesday is our meeting night. Um, but the Volunteer Association is in essence the social arm of the fire department, okay? And what I mean by that is they'll handle like the picnic, they'll take care of food, um, they get involved in a lot of the non-fire response related stuff, okay? So I mentioned the scholarship committee, we have that. Um, we have uh, the breakfast, Father's Day breakfast group. So, so the association takes care of all those non-fire related things. Um, the organization has its own leadership. So there's a president, there's a vice president, and they sit up here and you can see the different uh, roles. We have a treasurer, we have a secretary, and you'll get the groove after the first meeting, right? So, so they kind of uh, do run the, the association side uh, or the social arm uh, of the fire department, do a really good job. Uh, they have a set of bylaws that you'll be given. There's a lot of committee there's more than 20 committees um, so one of them for example if you're an antique car um, buff Wally uh, is the chair of the legacy apparatus committee and the legacy apparatus committee takes care of the antique trucks here right so that's an association function uh, Wally's the chair and he's got a number of members that like taking care of the old equipment to make sure it's in good shape that we take it out on a ride every so often uh, we'll take it to the car show here in town we'll take it to the parade um, but but that's like one example of one group 
Um, the other thing is that you can be as active or inactive as you want. So if you don't want to chair a committee, you don't have to chair a committee, okay? But if you want to meet other people, I would say get involved in a committee, okay? And it, it's pretty good and it's a lot of fun. So we'll cover a few other things. Safety and health uh, is important. So uh, you'll see when you get your policies, uh, there's grooming standards here. So for mustaches, beards, and piercings, uh, why would we have those? from a safety standpoint, right? If you look like ZZ Top, okay, there's no way you can put on a self-contained breathing apparatus and be able to get a seal on your mask, right? So, so we want to make sure that, that your grooming standards are to the fact that your safety equipment will work if you have to do it, right? Um, we don't care if you have a mustache, we don't care if you have a goatee, we don't care if you have facial hair, we just want to make sure that your mask gets a seal so that you can safely fight a fire. And, and you'll get more information about that. Uh, we also have a safety committee. So the safety committee notes are posted downstairs so you can all read them. Uh, that includes volunteers as well as career people. Uh, fire and EMS. Uh, we have an exposure control plan. Uh, and since I'm talking about safety and health, any idea what an exposure control plan would be for? What could you possibly be exposed to here? Carcinogens. Carcinogens. What else? Bloodborne pathogens. Blood pathogens. Yep. And other things that people have, right? Like maybe tuberculosis. I hate to say it, but that's an ex exposure, right? So if there is an exposure, you'll learn through the training on how do you document that, how do we take care of you, and what the agency does to help you, okay? So again, we have these folks I talked about that work here, like the chief, the deputy chief, the EMS division chief, that's what they're doing, is making sure that we have processes in place to handle these when they happen, okay? We also have HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability Protection Act. Uh, the easiest thing to remember for HIPAA is if you go to a medical call, um, you're gonna see people that are in need of assistance. Uh, it's nobody's business on what you saw. Right, so you can't say, hey, I was just at Johnny Jones's house and so-and-so's got that. That would be a violation of HIPAA. Um, the, the easiest rule for medical calls is what you see here stays here, okay? Uh, you don't wanna be the one that's like, oh, I talked to Seth Waller from the fire department at Safeway and he said that so-and-so's got that. Okay, that'll just destroy the organization, but it also destroys the trust that the community has with us, right? And that hasn't happened here, but just keep it here, okay? And that's the best way. Uh, and the other thing is if you're struggling with what you've seen on some of our calls, that's what our chaplains are here for, right? You say, look, I went to this, I, I, you know, I haven't been able to sleep, did I do something wrong? I, I, could I have done something different? The chaplains are here to give you that support after calls as well. Uh, we decontaminate the uh, equipment, we decontaminate the station, so you get all that information. Uh, we do uh, have a, a daytime uh, fitness program, so uh, the career staff work out every day at 11 o'clock, you're welcome to join them uh, and come down if you wanna stay physically fit. Uh, it's a great opportunity here. Uh, there's no cost to you other than, uh, you know, be here with workout gear and a pair of sneakers and they'll do the rest. Um, so benefits, uh, there are, Really not many benefits that we give you. You're not gonna be rich, uh, I'll tell you that as a volunteer, but we'll do some things for you. So there's life insurance, there's what we call LOSAP, length, length of service award program. So the city does put money aside and we basically put it into a, an investment fund for you so that when you get old enough to retire, there'll be some money there for you. So you, you, the city of Dallas kind of says, thank you for your service. Uh, depending on how busy you are, that's how much money goes into your account. So it's based on your training hours, it's based on your responses. Uh, and also if you're an officer, your duty officer, weekends, but that's something that we make available to you, and it's not much, but it's better than a kick in the teeth, right? So, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a nice benefit, especially as you get older. Um, we provide workers' comp. Uh, that's required by law. Uh, we also have tuition assistance, so if you want to go through a program and be like I mentioned EMT, uh, you know, the fire department will work with you to kind of see if we can help provide that for you. Uh, and the same is true, we have Harpy Bovard Scholarship for family members, so your kids can apply uh, as they're going through the schools for that benefit. Um, so let's cover just, uh, got a, geez, another page and a half, so we'll get through this. So operations, how are you notified of call, do you think? Pager, phone. Pager, iPhone, right? We have an iPhone app, we also have pagers that we'll give you. You don't have to go out of pocket to be a member here, right? So if you don't have an iPhone, don't go out and buy an iPhone, okay? We'll give you a pager. If you have an iPhone, we'll give you the app that you can get the calls right to your phone, okay? And a lot of people do that. Uh, many, many moons ago, there used to be a siren that went off every time there was a call and it drove the community crazy. Now the siren only goes off at noon every day and if it wasn't for the siren, people wouldn't know it's lunchtime, okay? There would be hundreds of people in town that would forget to eat, all right? So the siren goes off only at lunchtime here. Uh, it used to go off for every call, um, but now it's just for that. We already covered the radio numbering system. Dallas is what numbers? 
100, super easy, great, okay, everybody passed, okay. Um, the other thing that we um, are very clear about um, is that we do not want you taking pictures at incident scenes, okay? Um, we share that because um, you're going to be at car accidents, fires, other things like that. Um, you're not there as a photographer, okay? Uh, if you do have to take a picture because somebody asks you to, you need to email that to April Welsh so she can keep it. Because guess what you've done when you're at a scene of an incident taking a photo? Well, you probably don't know this, but I'll, I'll help you. You have created a public record. Okay, because you are there as a member of this organization, so you're a member of a public government body, that picture now belongs to Dallas Fire and EMS, and then we have to manage that. So don't take pictures, right? This isn't for your Hall of Fame. Okay, so don't go, hey, look at this cool car accident I was at, because guess what? People don't want to go to your Facebook and see about emergencies. Okay, that's not what you're there about. If they want to see emergencies, they can go to Dallas Fire and EMS Facebook, where we'll post pictures that are appropriate. But nobody wants to see things on your Facebook page, right? You shouldn't be the one sharing stuff, so don't take pictures at incident scenes. Okay, uh, the next one, which is a big one, is driving personal vehicles to the fire station. Okay, so when your pager goes off, you'll be super excited, right? We got a house fire, car accident, we're going to a call. What do we expect when you drive your personal vehicle to the fire station? Obey traffic laws. Obey traffic laws. Be a role model. Okay, don't speed. Okay, if you cannot get here safely, you cannot help anybody else. Okay, the last thing that we need is for the police department to call up and say, hey, so and so blew through a stop sign on the way to the fire station, or so and so was going 50 miles an hour down Main Street going to the fire station. One is that doesn't make us look good it doesn't make you look good either, okay? And if you get too many of those complaints here, you probably won't be here anymore, okay? So be a community role model, all right? Uh, when you come to the fire station, park in the base, or I'm sorry, park in the stalls that you see around the building. It says responder parking, so there's stalls out front, there's stalls out back, there's stalls on the side. Um, so don't park on people's driveways and stuff like that. Uh, be a good neighbor, so, and there's plenty of parking here. Um, you will have the ability in the future, once you're off probation, that we do bring on a fourth uh, person on cruise as a volunteer to go with our three-person staffing. So there's days where you can go out on a shift, um, but that'll kick up again after the first of the year. But that's something um, we've implemented with Chief Dickerson. It's worked out really well because um, some of you um, might live far out where you might not make that truck on a nighttime call. So we've implemented this as a way for you, if you're on a day off, that you can come and basically ride along as the fourth person and see what the crews do and get more calls under your belt. So it's just a way to kind of learn and train, but also kind of experience the whole process and it's worked out really well. Um, guests at the fire station. Uh, yes and no. If you want to come and give somebody a tour and show them the trucks and stuff like that, yes. Um, but upstairs here, like, is not like where you should just hang out and play Xbox with like seven of your friends. Um, so this is not your social club, okay? This is a fire station. This is a government building. Um, so keep that in mind, right? Yes, you want to show your fr friends, your family, the trucks, your gear. Absolutely cool. To hang out up here till three o'clock in the morning, not cool. That that's not okay. Um, wearing fire department logo wear, uh, you'll get sweatshirts, hats, t-shirts, stuff like that as a member. Uh, remember where I'm at the right place for the right reason. Okay, so if you're coming to a fire department event, that's fine. If you're shopping at Safeway and you're wearing your fire department sweatshirt, nobody cares. Uh, if you're hanging out at, um, you know, a bar, uh, wearing a fire department t-shirt or sweatshirt, that is not cool. Okay, so we don't want you to do that. That just brings a bad image to the fire department. Uh, access to the fire station, um, you will get a, a, a password once you're through training on how to get in and out of the building. Uh, that is your password. Don't give that password to anybody else, okay? Um, we have honestly millions of dollars worth of equipment in this building, uh, and we don't want to lose any of it, right? So you might give that password to somebody else that has bad intentions. That is your password to get in this building for fire department business, not for somebody else to come in here and do something, okay? Um, media community relations. Oh, this is a good one. So you are not the spokesperson for Dallas Fire and EMS. So if somebody came up and asked you, hey, what happened at that fire last night? Uh, and they're from like the Statesman Journal or KGW or the Oregonian, your response is, you should call April Welsh at the Dallas Fire Department and she will give you that information. And if it's on the scene of an incident, you need to talk to the incident commander, okay? It shouldn't be you saying, oh man, this was a really bad fire. 
uh, you know, that's not what your role is. Your role is to be a firefighter, a, a responder, uh, not a public relations person. Okay, so always um, make sure you hand that off. Oh, there is also underwritten rule here that if you get your picture in the newspaper, you will buy ice cream. So that is a program we've implemented to prevent you from talking to media members, okay? So it's one thing if you're like shagging hose or cutting a car up and a reporter takes a picture. If your picture is in the paper and you're identifiable, you will have to buy ice cream, okay? So, uh, and if you're gonna have your picture in the paper, look busy, okay? You don't wanna have your hands in your pockets or be leaning against something, so, so uh, be busy, be active, okay? Uh, and then also we offer a Wi-Fi here in the fire station if you guys wanna use that. All right, so let's, uh, let's bring things to a close here. So we covered the engines, so engine 101, 102, ladder 101, okay, you'll get to see those today. You probably already have. Uh, support 108, so these folks respond in what's called support 108, chaplains or chaplain 113. Uh, we already talked about the Dallas EMS service area, okay, paramedics and then EMTs. What's the difference between a paramedic and an EMT? level of training, okay? A paramedic can provide a much higher level of care than an EMT. EMTs are important, right? But paramedics are the ones that know the drugs, know how to do a lot more different procedures, uh, and, and that's what they do, and that's the care that we provide. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to ride along with them, you'll just see that those men and women do amazing work uh, in providing medical care here in, in our community. We're fortunate to have them, okay? Uh, so um, what do we expect from you when you come back from a call? Okay, um, so a couple of things. One is that we want you to make sure that the rig is ready to go out for another call. Okay, so it's not like you just leave everything and somebody fixes it in the morning. Okay, the, the job of the day crew is not to clean up after the volunteers. Okay, there might be things that they have to do if something's broken. Okay, we would tag that and say it's broken and they would figure out how to fix it or get it to the shops. But they're not going to clean your gear. They're not going to restore the air packs. They're not going to wash your truck. That's what we do, right? So when you come back from the call, you make sure your gear is clean and serviceable. You make sure your air packs are clean and restored so the bottles are ready to go. You make sure that your trucks look just as clean as when you left, right? That's just being good stewards of the resources the city gave us. Um, we wash your trucks after each call, unless it's super cold outside and it's freezing. Okay, or unless there's a water restriction. Um, weekly, we truck check. So on drill nights, when you come down, we'll do truck checks to make sure everything is ready to go. Um, and that also gives you familiarization uh, with the rigs. Uh, we do... Uh, use brushes and sponges for the trucks okay so we want to make sure we take care of them uh, restore supplies that were used and as I mentioned if something's broken put a red tag on it let the officer know right so we can't fix it unless we know what it is um, so just a few other things we talked about our mutual aid partners uh, we actually go outside of this area too so we do um, have uh, from time to time called in people outside of the circle so we have called in Salem fire to help us out Okay, Salem Fire has called us. Uh, we've also called in Adair, we've called in Corvallis, we call in Amity, we call in McMinnville. But that means that our local partners are like strapped, right? Or it's a bigger fire, we need more help. But our mutual aid doesn't stop there, right? And the same is true um, with us responding to other areas. So we just had, um, we sent a crew down to the fire outside of Upper McKenzie. Um, so they went on state conflagration uh, mobilization. So they were down in Lane County for almost two weeks. Um, so we're a good statewide partner also. Uh, and the other group that we get help from uh, is not a fire department, but has a fire presence, which is Oregon Department of Forestry. So in the summertime, um, they'll come in and help us, and we'll help them also on different incidents. And they're right up here on uh, Kings Valley, uh, outside of Walmart. City partners, you already mentioned, Dallas Police Public Works. Uh, city Shops takes care of our vehicles, so they have mechanics there. And then City Hall is the business. Uh, we already talked about the police partners. Dallas Police, like definitely Polk County Sheriff's Office, uh, even the Oregon State Police will help if we're out on Highway 22 or Highway 99. Okay, so uniforms, really simple. This is a Class B uniform, okay? Uh, a Class A is like the full, like the Captain Steubing look, like the Navy Admiral, okay? And that's for special events. Uh, and then a Class C would be like your T-shirt and black pants, okay, or sweatshirt, uh, and you'll get all of that, all right? So a few other things, uh, and these are like Dallas Fire specific. So when was Dallas Fire formed? Anybody remember? 1878. 1878, good memory. It's almost like we have incorporated it into our logo. Yeah, 
We were here before the city of Dallas, okay? It's an amazing history and the support of this community is fantastic, okay? Uh, this community truly supports this organization, okay? And, and that's something that we cherish and we wanna make sure that we don't lose. The wall of honor that is up there to your uh, left or to your right, um, that was something, something implemented about five years ago so that we can honor uh, people of our organization that have kind of gone above and beyond, not just at the fire department, but in our community. Okay, so I would encourage you like on your break or when you're up here, just kind of read about all those different individuals. Delbert Fredericks, I'll share with you, uh, passed away not too long, but Delbert was a volunteer here for 65 years. I'm not asking you to be volunteers for 65 years. I don't know if Delbert's record will ever be beaten, but that's how much he cared about this organization, this community, he did it for 65 years, okay? Uh, Pete Peters ran a service station here. He also did a lot of stuff. Harpy Vovard um, actually lived in the fire station. Okay, so Harpy used to work for the railroad. Uh, the fire department, in essence, became Harpy's home. Uh, there are people that still believe Harpy Bovard lives in the fire station. So if you believe in paranormal activity or ghosts, um, there are some people here that believe Harpy is still in the building. Okay, Harpy used to live downstairs in what's now the elevator shaft. That was a little area that Harpy lived in the station 24 hours a day. Um, he used to pick up mail from City Hall, delivered around town. Um, we honored him by the Harpy Boulevard Scholarship Fund. Uh, this basically became his family. The community became his family, uh, and he was here until he passed away. Um, and then uh, a couple of other people, uh, Kurt uh, Lamb is on there. Um, his uh, son was also a firefighter, Warren. Uh, Jack Condon, his son, is a member here now, Sean. Uh, and then Dave Peterson was a chaplain uh, that put the chaplain program together. But read about the history of those people uh, because it kind of gives you an idea about what the organization's about and what the people that have been here uh, have done. So we just talked about Harpy Bovard. We talked about Pete Peters. Oh, here's something that you'll get to see. Um, we do a lot of really good things here, but there are times that our people are not at their best and we make mistakes. We like to make fun of people who make mistakes. And I say that in a good way, all right? If it's a safety violation, it is not, we do not make fun of that. But there are times that people will do just things that you won't believe. So we honor them with what we call the Lamont A. Horton Award of Excellence. And if you're nominated for that and you're selected for that, you get to sit in the chair of honor uh, at the business meeting so that people can see and hear what you did. Um, so it may be something like, you know, your radio, your portable radio fell off the bumper of the truck because you forgot to put it in and somebody picked it up down at the intersection and brought it to the fire station. Um, it, it could be that you fell out of the rig because your headset was stuck to your head and you forgot to take it off. Um, it could be, you know, a number of different things, but they're pretty hilarious when they come up. Uh, and it's a good way for us to kind of poke fun at each other and to be human and be realistic, um, but also not in a, a, an offensive way. So if you're ever nominated for the LAH, your, your, your world is not over, okay? You'll probably get a good laugh out of it as well uh, and, and just go with it, okay? It's not meant to, to make fun of people. Uh, if you go down to the Arboretum, there is a gazebo in the Arboretum uh, that was built to honor Pete Peters. Um, so the gazebo or the park was uh, really special to him. Um, so when he had 50 years of service, we asked what we could do for him. Uh, Pete was really our food person, but also the deputy chief. Um, he brought us together uh, for decades. So um, Pete says, just do something for the community. So we built a gazebo over at the Arboretum and it's, uh, his name is actually on top of it on the weather main that has the fire truck on it. Um, so so that's something that we take care of and it's pretty cool. Uh, and Pete's honored in the back there. So when we uh, built the gazebo and cut the ribbon that's back there in that frame, his turnouts are back there. And he actually wanted to run uh, with his family to the gazebo dedication in the Mac. Um, so that's something that we did for him. Uh, just an awesome guy. Uh, so what was the first motorized piece of fire equipment for Dallas Fire? Any ideas? Okay, it's the Stutz, yeah. So we're, we're really fortunate in Dallas. Some people might say we get rid of nothing, okay? I, I would say we get rid of things that aren't important, but we've kept things that are important. So we have kept four of our original fire apparatus, okay? And I can't even say fire trucks because two of them aren't trucks, okay? So we have a, uh, so if you look at the top of that picture to the right of the speaker, you see that like big wagon thing, that wheel with hose on it? That's uh, first fire truck, right? So way back in Dallas, there were wooden cisterns in the streets. So think of pipes made out of wood. 
that would bring the water into the city and then the fire department would basically get into those to get water okay so that was a hose cart that hose cart on the top is out at the Polk County Museum so that still exists okay the other thing right below that is the ladder wagon which still exists downstairs from 1898 Wally 1889. 1889. So the 1889 ladder wagon is still here. Okay, and they just had the real wheels redone, and we'll take it out for the summer fest parade and give it a spin. Uh, those two are all human power. Okay, so it's not horsepower; it's human power. That's how they used to pull them around town. All right, and then the first rig was the Stutz, was the first motorized fire truck, which we still have. 1924, 1925 Stutz Bearcat downstairs. It's a mini Stutz, not the big Stutz, uh, and there are eight Stutz fire engines in Oregon. Uh, still today that fire departments have kept as antiques. When the fire department bought that, it actually was brought into town on a rail car. Um, so that gives you an idea way back how things were, right? It's not like you drove to the factory and brought it here. Um, they actually brought it into town on a rail car. And then the other antique we have is the Mac down downstairs, which is a 1949-1950 uh, Mac fire truck. So that's kind of the legacy apparatus, and it's pretty cool uh, that we keep our history alive through that, and it kind of tells the story. Um, so here's another one. Where was the fire station at before it was here? Anybody know? Across the street. Across the street, City Hall. Okay. So City Hall has the Civic Center here. The Civic Center, those windows used to be doors and the fire station used to be there. And the pole that you see downstairs that you can't slide down anymore because somebody got hurt, um, that pole actually came from City Hall over to here when this new fire station was built. All right, so that's just in case anybody ever asks you that. Um, I already told you, has anybody ever lived in a fire station? The answer was yes. That's Harpy Bovard. Um, here's one that a lot of people wonder. Why are the ambulances in a different building? Anybody know? Frank? Way back, the ambulances used to be in this building when it started. They were right downstairs where the two antique trucks are, so the ambulances were parked there. But then as we, the community, realized we needed to go to 24-7 staffing and coverage, and the ambulances got bigger, um, the ambulance building was built next door with, with bunk rooms in it, as well as bigger bays so that the ambulances could fit in there. All right? It's not that they're not wanted here, but they're over there, okay? Because that building kind of handles their operations. The other thing that's kind of unique is while we're Dallas Fire and EMS, um, Dallas EMS and Fire are really within the city two different departments, two different organizations. The EMS charges for transport. So if you go on a medical call and you have to be transported, the ambulance will bill for that service. So they're basically a service provider. So they recoup the cost and then the taxpayers offset that. Um, but that is a separate organization to the fire department, but the chief is in charge of both of them. But operationally, we're just one group. But from a business side, for the budget in the city, two separate different departments. Okay? Again, something the chief worries about, but in case you ever wonder, that's why it's there. Uh, and ultimately, I think the long-term plan under the public safety building would be to bring the EMS into this building along with police. So police, fire, EMS would be in one building, so the ambulance would be uh, in the same uh, garage, if you will, as all the fire trucks. Okay, so why are the fire trucks in Dallas white? Anybody know? Truly something to be unique. Okay, this started back in the 40s. Okay, everybody was red. Dallas wanted to be white because they thought we would look different and we've been white ever since. Okay, and, and as long as I've been in the fire service, it doesn't matter if you're white, white over red, red over white, red, different shades of red, lime green, yellow. Uh, every fire department, just like a football team, picks its own colors. Dallas has been white ever since. Uh, they were the first ones in the Northwest to go white. They thought that was pretty cool and we've stayed white ever since. Uh, it was a big issue here when we bought the ambulance from uh, Salem, Todd, and that ambulance came in as building red. Because you would have thought like the world was coming to an end, okay? It's just the way it is, okay? It's just the red, it's the only red one. It's, it's fine, it's, it's despair, okay? Uh, and what was the largest fire in Dallas history? Anybody know? Anybody grow up here? Well, that, that was like the biggest, right? But not like that was the biggest because that said that we needed a fire department. So I don't know if I'd count that one. Uh, the biggest fire ever in town actually was out on Old Monmouth Cutoff and it was in the Pregitzer building, which is Tyco, which is now American Gas. Um, but that fire, that was a chip uh, manufacturing, like electronics. And that fire went on for almost a week. 
uh, and they were bringing crews in from across the Willamette Valley to rotate people out. They even had the Mac antique pumping on that fire. That's how big it was. But that was the biggest fire in Dallas's history uh, as far as cost and duration. Okay, so if anybody ever asks, it was Tyco, right, which is Pregator. Uh, and thankfully, nobody got hurt there. Okay, what's that? Wow, when was Pregator, Wally? 1987. Yeah, see, he hasn't forgotten it yet. And how many days are you out there, Wally? Okay, you were still at Newport. All right. So those are kind of the, the benchmarks of Dallas Fire. So what I thought, you know, when I put this together is, what's the organization about, right? So I, I think hopefully what you've heard is there's a lot of history here. There's a lot of pride here. Um, we have an amazing workforce of career volunteer people. Um, and, and really all of you here now are going to help write the next chapter of the organization. Um, because we're not wed to the way we've always done things, right? We are very innovative. If you look downstairs at the apparatus, it's pretty amazing what the taxpayers have given us to provide service. Um, there are many, many fire departments across the country that don't even have half of what we have here. Uh, and we are very blessed by the equipment that we're given. Uh, we're fortunate to have the leadership of, of the staff that work here that have those discussions with the city manager and the city council and the community. Um, we're, we're, we're well equipped uh, from head to toe as individuals, but also from the rolling stock that we have. And from a training standpoint, um, we can compare with any career fire department as far as the training that we provide and offer to you. So it, it's pretty fortunate. So uh, really your role is now to help us write the next chapter, right? Get you trained. Let's get you responding, and then figure out what you want to do to be, uh, uh, you know, that next uh, that next Harpy Bovard, that next Pete Peters, that next Jack Condon, right? Because everybody writes their own history here, and uh, you get to write that based on how you want to interact. If you just want to come to calls and go home, that's fine. Uh, if you want to do other things, there's a lot of opportunities here, and it's not just firefighting; it's all kind of stuff. So, association memberships, it's uh, community events, uh, you name it. So, anything I didn't talk about, anything I didn't cover. Anything you're wondering about. Okay. Here's the one thing I can't answer for you, and this comes up every so often, I'll end with this one. When you come in and out of the engine bays, you'll notice that there is a stamping on the floor of roses. Some people believe that was done many moons ago when this building was built as a way for the family members to say, we care for you when the fire trucks went in and out of the building and that we want you to come back. I can't prove that. Uh, nobody's ever verified that. It could also be just something that the concrete people did to kind of as a, a little um, embossment. But uh, there's a belief that that's for the family members when you go to a call that we care for you and that we love you and we want you to come back safely. And that's actually a pretty good story, right? So those are the different kind of things that are out there. So uh, welcome aboard. Uh, you're in good hands. Uh, and let's take a break. And when do you want them back, Chief? Yep, 940. So 10 minutes. Bathrooms are downstairs. There's one up here. You got some snacks back there. So welcome aboard. Mm -hmm.